All through high school, I, I felt this need to be the center of attention, the need to have everyone like me, and, and this need to always please people. And to this day, I've learned that's, I don't need to do that. But that's where the root of all my pain and all my issues, I guess, started. I grew up in church. I went every Sunday to the point like I was playing guitar on worship band. From the eyes of an outsider, I was a perfect Christian. I didn't really do anything wrong. I was leading worship and being a part of the, the worship at church. I never missed a Sunday, but looking back now, there was so much that was actually missing. I was there for church. I wasn't there for a relationship. And I never really actually knew God. Back then, my interest was more in myself and the love of myself and, and getting myself to a point that everyone was like, whoa, that's, that's Mike. That fall, I got one of my first DJ gigs doing a, a great seven or eight dance. I, I remember bringing all my gear. I remember feeling all this joy of, yeah, I'm, I'm doing something for myself. I'm doing what I want to do. I'm doing what I need to do is what I felt it was. Everyone that dance looked at me like this celebrity, like, oh, that's, yeah, that's the DJ. And at that point in time, I, I loved that feeling. I took that feeling and I ran with it. Um, by the time I was 14, 15, I got my first booking to actually DJ 19 plus clubs. This is after doing a bunch of all ages, being known as the number one all age DJ in Durham region and breaking into Toronto. But even that, it wasn't it wasn't enough for me. You know, like in the back of my head, I'm like, okay, I'm just doing these all age dance. You know, that's not where real DJs end up. That's not what real DJs do. So by the time I was 15 and I got my first 19 plus gig, I w wasn't even of legal age. But at that point, it's like, okay, I'm making club owners money, so they don't really care. All they said was just don't drink. But let's be honest, that didn't happen. It's that passion, that love for, for DJing just began to grow and grow and grow to the point that I got asked to DJ with a guy named Young Stitch, which I still to this day talk to him. He's still a phenomenal guy. Fast forward a little bit, Stitch and I, we were on, on tour. And at this point, I had already kind of dabbled in, in, in certain drugs. But really during that tour was when I really felt that I got to get messed up for these shows. I got to get myself in a mindset that I can put on a show. I really had myself convinced that I couldn't do that sober. And so I began to have this routine before shows where I would sniff a bunch of coke, I would down a bunch of drinks and basically get myself hammered before I even went on stage. And I did this for months and months to the point where I was working as a chef in Toronto at the same time as one of our tours. And I started at 8 a.m. one day, finished at five. And from Toronto, I drove to Niagara. We did a show. We finished up at 3 a.m. We went back to the hotel, continued partying. By 6 a.m., I drove back to Toronto to work a whole other shift. I vividly remember being on the line in the kitchen, reaching for something in the fridge and literally falling asleep and almost falling over right on the line. The line is where we make all the food. And I remember just thinking back and it's like, really, what am I doing? One other major milestone that I look back that had an effect on my addiction and where it took me was when I lost my best friend. I remember getting a, a call at 6 a.m. in the morning and Taffa's not with us anymore, man. It took me, it took me until I actually seen him in the casket before, before I actually accepted it. I remember we were getting together at a after party just to celebrate his life and I grabbed a half gram. After a week of not doing it and being strong, I just, I couldn't do it because I couldn't handle the pain. Things were just getting worse. Now keep in mind this whole time I was supporting my habit by selling and distributing coke to my friends. I'd walk in with a big bag of coke and walk out with a big bag of cash. 
So one day after my shift, I walked outside to go make a sale. And I got into my buddy's car, which I had gotten into many, many times before. And within five seconds, I had a gun to my head. And he cocked it and he said, give me everything. So I gave him everything. I, at this point, I did not want to lose my life. And I just, I remember getting out of the car after everything had been taken and just how the heck am I alive? Those feelings just over the next few hours of after being robbed just began to grow and grow and to the point that I, I picked up what I thought was gonna be a lethal amount of cocaine did it all in about the span of about 10 minutes. I remember laying on the couch, feeling like my heart was just gonna explode, feeling like everything was coming down on me, and feeling like every single thought that I had ever thought was going through my head. It wasn't until nine o'clock the following morning that I realized that I wasn't successful in my attempt. And, Out of, out of nowhere, I had this weird feeling that I needed to go to church. So that morning, nine o'clock, I still high, still drunk. I walked, I think it was about five kilometers in the blistering cold to this church. And I walked in. The only thing I actually remember from that morning was it was the first time I ever felt welcomed at church. And I was, I was because I believe Pastor Brian walked up to me and I was a single guy in the middle of a crowd. And all he said was, I'm glad you're here and gave me a hug. You know, I didn't really talk to many other people. I sat in the back of the sanctuary and I still can't even tell you what that message was about, but I just, that was the first time I really felt like I was where I needed to be. And I went home, passed out on the couch finally after not sleeping. And it was about five o'clock in the evening. I remember my mom waking me up and just bawling her eyes out. <laughs> and she just, she told me she thought, thought I was dead. And my dad, I've never really seen my dad bawl his eyes out. And my mom looked over on the coffee table and she, she saw the bulletin from church. She, he cried even harder. She shared with me right then and there. I'm not crying because it's upsetting me. I'm crying because God is good. <laughs> and she said the night before, when we couldn't get a hold of you, and when we didn't know where you were or what you were doing, we sat there and we prayed that you would make it to church the next morning. <laughs> and at that point, I got chills. <laughs> and. I didn't really know what to think, but in that moment, I knew I had my first real encounter with God. There was things I had to work on, but there was immediate mindset shift. That's kind of what my parents and I, we consider like my turning point weekend. I wasn't immediately better, I wasn't immediately sober, but my view just on everything began to change. I remember my dad giving me the nickname Bones because I pretty much locked myself in my parents' house and binge watched 13 seasons of Bones in a matter of two weeks because I was at the point that I didn't want to go out and get high anymore. I really, at this point, had nowhere to go. That's when we began talking about Teen Challenge and and the possibility of me going, going there. And for someone that had been using a lot of drugs and before this weekend really didn't want anything to do with the church, the idea of spending 12 months at a faith-based drug and alcohol rehab was like, yeah, okay, good one. Well, my parents gave me the option between Teen Challenge and another place out west. And the one out west, it was going to be like this luxurious place where I had a pool, a hot tub or whatever I can use. I had this desire just to be that much closer to my family. 
I got to the point where we, we made the decision that I wanted to go to Teen Challenge. And so we started that process. I look back and there was many, many hiccups, but I also look back now and those hiccups were there for a reason. It was January 23rd, I wanna say, was my initial intake date. I had got all my medical stuff done. I had seen the doctor and we drove all the way to London and we started the intake process. We get to the point where they asked me about medications. My doctor had decided to put me on uh, Seroquel to help me with my sleep as I'm, you know, withdrawing. And little did I know that you needed to be on medications for at least a month before you actually went into Teen Challenge. At this point, it had been two weeks I had been on that. So that, that day they actually, they turned me away and they, they said, no, you're gonna have to go, go back home and come back once you've been on them for about a, a month. And I, I remember stepping outside to the fire pit, the teen challenge, kicking things, throwing things. And I w at this point, any mindset of going and bettering myself was gone. I don't need it. And so we went back home, again, a lot, pretty much locked myself in my parents' place. And about two days after that, I, I was back to wanting to go and wanting to be there. And it was March 3rd. That was my actual intake. Those first two weeks were hell. You know, from the, the mix of me coming off all these drugs, and if I didn't have the cocaine, I would take whatever whatever was there. Between that and being in a building with 50 other recovering drug addicts, I'll let you decide how that was. I guess the best way to put it, there's a lot of pain in that building. A lot of undealt with pain, a lot of unknown pain. I just. I, I remember up until my fourth month there, I every day I wanted to leave. I wanted to get out of there. I did not want to be there. Till I decided to get baptized while I was there. This came after me first reading uh, in my morning devotions there, the, the story of the prodigal son. And I remember reading that and, and it was breaking down. It was the first time I read the Bible and actually felt like I related to it. And it's like, it's not that your, your parents are upset that you did what you did. They're, they're happy that you're coming back and, and, and the son that they had when, they, when you were younger is, is coming back. I just wanna be the guy I was before, the guy before I touched any of these drugs, the guy before I did any of these stupid things. Now, while I was in in Teen Challenge, I, I realized that I don't want to be the man I was before. I want to be a completely new person, a completely, I want to have a new view on life. As much as that was the best time that I remember myself being, I realized that I wanted to be something new. I wanted to see myself in a completely different light. I really started to dive deep into into the Word and into, into what God was really wanting to show me and, and really want to do for me. It was then that I made the, the commitment to God and decided that, okay, I wanna get baptized. So me along with uh, four other guys, we got baptized in the, the, the pool at Teen Challenge, each one by one sharing our testimony. But I will never forget that the moment after each of us were brought underwater and raised back up, there was one little hole in the clouds and the sun shone down right on each of us. And it was only for about 10 to 15 seconds right after. Holy, God's with us, God's with me, he's, he's here. As much as that weekend where I went to church was a turning point, this was a turning point in my faith. That was a turning point in my life. This was a turning point in my faith and relationship with God. The day after I immediately started to just dig that much deeper into what God was wanting to show me. It didn't make the next year any more easy. In fact, I think it made it even harder. I look back and I know that it was for the best. Probably three months before I graduated, I had to start thinking about, okay, what am I gonna do when I get out? What am I gonna do for work? 
where am I going to live? Because in the back of my head, I did not want to go back to Oshawa. I did not want to go back to where I knew drugs. It was a family friend named Lynn McNutt that actually sent me a message that, hey, there's a sous chef job available at Fair Havens. I'm like, yeah, I've got four months left of Teen Challenge and I cannot, I, I'm not leaving. I'm, I'm finishing this up, I need to do this. Two weeks later, I get a message from my aunt. Hey, there's a sous chef job available at Fair Havens. I think you'd be great for it. And again, I said, no, I got, I got to finish where I'm at. Then finally, I had one other person mention it to me and I'm like, okay, I need to give this some attention. And so I reached out to Andrew, who was the executive chef at the time. And we started talking, we had a phone, phone call uh, and we got kind of got to know each other. Then we decided that I was gonna come to a, a working in-person interview. I remember <laughs> driving up here with my dad from London. It was about a three and a half, four hour drive, but the closer we got here, I, I, I remember telling my dad, I feel like I'm going home. <laughs> it was the first kitchen I ever worked in. We pull on grounds and I'm like, dad, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm home. There was nothing negative about the, the interview. It was amazing. Andrew and I hit it off. Still to this day, we're, we're great friends. But yeah, we finished that up. I went back to Teen Challenge and I think it was a week later, Andrew emailed me and said, yeah, well, you've got the job. Little did I know there was not one other legitimate applicant for this job. <laughs> he had been waiting and praying and praying that, you know, the right person would just be put in his hands and he told me he didn't have one other person apply and you know that just solidified that this is where I need to be the, the God stories in this whole story just don't end at all I wasn't able to drive I'm like okay cool I've got a job but where the heck am I gonna live God already had that figured out and so Andrew and I got talking and he goes and he chats with his in-laws only to find out that his in-laws have been praying for some use for their empty bedroom. And it's, it's, no, it's just, it's overwhelming knowing that everything was planned out before I was even ready to go and take those steps and move down that path. I'm worried about what's gonna happen, but no, God had it under control the whole time. Everything started to fall into place, Every, you know, my, finances, I was starting to become better with them. I, I was working with younger youth that could definitely use a, a role model. And as much as that partially made me nervous, I knew that with what I had gone through, I was going to be able to relate with some of these kids and, and relate with some of the pain and, and things that they've gone through. And since being at Fair Havens, I got the chance to speak into their lives and share my experience and share just what I've gone through and what my life has been filled with. About a year ago when COVID began to hit, I got laid off. I remember the first thing I thought is, okay, God, <laughs> what, do, what, what do I do? And that's when I took my first Serb check and bought a case of brisket, smoked it off in the smoker that I just bought with my Serb check. Within like a week, it was sold to a bunch of people in the community here, okay? Okay, that uh, wasn't really my plan, but okay, I'm just gonna roll with it. Six months prior, Andrew had decided to go spend six months in Nicaragua, which then led me to take over the executive chef position and start to actually run the kitchen here at uh, Fair Havens, which was kind of overwhelming for me in a sense that 10 to 12 years prior, I was the dish guy and now I'm the boss. We got to a point where it's like, okay, uh, I don't know if this Corona COVID is going to go anywhere in the next little bit. So let's look at actually leasing this kitchen and making it ours, right? So we came down with an agreement with Fair Havens. We started to do our own thing, and that's where Trust was formed, Trust Food Works. And I had been running Trust for about a year prior under, under my name as just as a hot sauce company, and it was making hot sauce from scratch. I'll give you a, a brief synopsis of why I named it Trust. 
It's the same idea as a lot of the trust structures, hidden internal strength. You don't normally see them, but without them, you don't have structure and you don't have the strength that you need to hold something up. That was an homage to my DJ career because all my lights and everything were hung on trusses. So at the beginning of COVID, the first two weeks where I really didn't do anything, I was at a point where I just, I wasn't happy. I wasn't, I felt like everything that I had just worked towards and everything that God had helped me rebuild and was just stripped away and taken down. Why didn't I just stay where I was? Why did I work so hard to get here? But when you think one thing, God's saying another. Now, after about a year of running trust together, we are looking at expanding in different aspects. And I guess the only way I can say it is I wasn't gonna be able to do any of this without God having my back. I've got someone with their hand on my shoulder and standing behind me, no matter what I do, no matter where I am, that in itself is enough to help push me through those times that I really didn't think that I was gonna be able to push through. Do I have a lot of other things to work through? Yes. Do I have other pain that I need to, you know, revisit and deal with? Yeah, for sure, but I'm not worried. I'm not afraid of that anymore. If you don't keep your faith and keep your faith strong with God, you're not gonna hear him right. You're not gonna move forward right. Unfortunately, in the last year, I've had to see about 13 of my friends leave us. And that in itself is something else that I have a hard time dealing with. It's almost a sense of survivor's guilt. God, why am I still here when they're not? And then I listen and the only thing I can hear is just trust me, just trust me. If you're going through these things, don't hide, don't, don't run. It's so tempting and it's so easy to just turn the other way and run from your pain. You'll get a head start and you may feel like you're winning and you're beating it, but that pain's gonna catch up and it's gonna hit you in a way that you did not see it coming. It's only gonna hurt you in the end. And if you're like me and you've experienced multiple friends being taken away and and you feel like you should be one of them too. Don't don't feel like that because and I say it like it's an easy thing to process and get through your mind, but to change the way you feel, you need to change your mindset. If you're in a spot where you can relate to anything that I just said, start by opening up, start by speaking about it and talking about it. Don't let it get to the point where you're wanting to end things by yourself. The sooner you can reach out to someone you trust and someone that you love, I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, not saying it's gonna be pain-free, but the sooner that you can start to, to rebuild and face those demons that you have inside and begin to move forward in your life in a way that God would be proud. At this point, I'm coming up on five years completely sober of cocaine. I don't think I've ever been this happy before. To see where I was five years ago and where God's brought me to today, it's it's unreal. It's always been a dream of mine to own my own business, and you know, God, God's made that happen. <laughs> I'm just so thankful that I'm still here and God still wants me. God is stronger than my addiction. <laughs>